You are tuning into the Lehigh Low Ego High Impact Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Volkan Emre, along with a dynamic team of Kellogg School of Management alums. We are here on a shared mission to uncover the mindset that drives impact and success. On Lehigh, we have talked provoking conversations with incredibly successful entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors from around the globe. We uncover the mindset that drives them, allowing them to make a high impact without losing themselves to ego. Now, let's get started with today's episode. Hi from Evanston, Illinois. Today we are hosting Kellogg legend Harry Kramer. Harry is a Kellogg School of Management professor, former CEO of Baxter International and author of three best-selling leadership books. He's currently an executive partner with Medicine Dearborn Partners, a Chicago-based private equity firm, and he serves as a board member at various impactful companies, nonprofit organizations, and business councils. Harry has a bachelor's degree in mathematics and economics from Lawrence University of Wisconsin, and he received his MBA from Kellogg School of Management in 1979. For more about Harry, you can visit harrykramer.org. This episode is co-hosted by Kelly Meagle, a seasoned marketer, growth expert, and a senior executive, and a distinguished member of the Kellogg Executive MBA alumni. We are recording this podcast in the Allen Center of Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. Professor Kramer, it's an honor to have you on the Lehigh Mindset Podcast. And thank you very much, Kelly, for uh, being with me today uh, as, as a co-host. I look forward to having a uh, great and impactful discussion with you today. Well, it's great. It's an honor to be with you. I'm really looking forward to it. So Kelly and I, we are going to be having some rapid fire questions to warm up before we delve into details. So are you ready? I'm always ready. Okay. Coffee or tea? Neither. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Mountains or beaches? Beaches. Text or call? Call. Music or podcast? Music. PC or Mac? PC. Drive or fly? Drive. What's worse, dishes or laundry? Dishes. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> this is a question that I pay really close attention to. Not many people say dishes, actually. May I say why? Um, I actually have no problem doing the laundry. And when I put it in, I can read a book. I can make some phone calls. I try to call 20, 30 people every day. Mm-hmm. Doing dishes, it's hard for me to be doing stuff when I'm doing the dishes. But laundry, no problem. And I like folding things. No problem at all. World's okay. greatest multitasker. Yeah. yeah. Drive or fly? I, I think I asked it already. Um, an interesting question, like contributed by Kelly. Waffles or pancakes? Waffles. I'm really curious. What is the first app you open up in the morning? Financial Times. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, um, Professor Kramer. Can you start by giving our listeners a brief introduction to your background and your impressive and impactful journey to becoming the CEO of Baxter and then a Kellogg professor? Sure. And and first of all, just call me Harry. Everybody just calls me Harry, okay? Okay. Um, So uh, born in New York, um, my dad was a salesman, moved around, uh, ended up in Wisconsin, went to a small a liberal arts school, Lawrence University. I'm a big fan of liberal arts. Um, worked at Bank of America for a short time, came to Kellogg, which obviously changed my life. Um, and then I ended up going to work at um, uh, Baxter, Baxter Travenal. Back, at the time, it was Baxter Travenal Laboratories. Um, and um, I went there for two years as a junior financial analyst. I forgot to leave, and I was there for 25 years, <laughs> uh, ending up running small divisions. Big, we can talk about anything you'd like, international. Uh, I was the CFO for a while, but I, was, I never let my business card read um, chief financial officer. My business card read cash flow officer because it's all about cash flow, as, <laughs> as you Kellogg people know. Uh, and then I became the chairman and, uh, and CEO. 
And uh, the best of all worlds is I, for some reasons we can discuss, I ended up having the opportunity to come to Kellogg, which is a fun story as well. Mm -hmm. So we will talk about Kellogg and Kellogg Impact for sure during this podcast. Um, I am curious, like when you were rising up the corporate ladder at Baxter, um, you were also, I forgot to mention that in the introduction, but you have um, five children and now you have grandchildren, which is amazing. But how did you manage the work-life balance when you were rising up and being the CEO of Baxter? Yeah, so um, if you maybe remember from one of my classes, I never talk about work-life balance. I talk about life balance. Because if you think about work-life balance, it sounds like you're either working or living, and some of us are working. Mm -hmm. I always refer to it as life balance. And in my mind, the key thing is to take a little self-reflection, if you remember, and figure out what is really important to you. And when I was writing the third book, you're 168, I literally ask people, how do you think about life balance? And for me, life balance is a combination mm -hmm. of, in no particular order, your career, your family, your spirituality, your health, having a little bit of fun, making a difference in the world. And thinking through those six components is something that, in my mind, is, is the key to everything. And very early on, I decided my job is important, but I married somebody that I said I'd spend the rest of my life with. I really thought the idea of having a family was important. My spirituality happens to be important to me. It may not be to others. Health is pretty important because it isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. And we're here for a blink of an eye. So maybe we have a moral responsibility to make the world a better place. So, so that idea of knowing that had an enormous impact on every role I was always in. Um, and by the way, many people will say, I'm having trouble balancing my life. Most people that are having trouble balancing their life haven't been self-reflective enough to figure out what they're trying to balance. So it all starts with knowing yourself, knowing your values, knowing your purpose, which I've been fanatical about uh, since I was a, a student at Kellogg. So I want to add to that a little bit. I've had the luxury of having an amazing partner in my life. My husband has been incredibly supportive of my journey and my time at Kellogg, supporting me in my career path. Tell me a little bit about your wife and her supporting you, her journey through all of this, and what would her perspective be? Well, we all have heroes, and, and my hero of heroes is, is my wife, Julie. Uh, and anybody who's taken my classes know I spend a lot of time in every one of the classes talking about her. Um, she is literally an unbelievable person who actually went to Kellogg, probably much brighter than I, and she ended up going to work for Citibank uh, for 15 years, uh, in addition to you know raising five children. Of course, I always say I have five children. She always says she has six children because she includes me in that, in that, in that mixture of, 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 of the children. Um, and we spent a lot of time, Kelly, a lot of time, uh, before we got married, right after we got married, on the way to having children, constantly asking what really is important what really is important. And yes, we want to have a nice job. Yes, we want to have a nice career. But but let's think about an order of importance of where does our faith, where does our family, where do our moral commitments come? And every time I would get promoted, every time I would get promoted, Kelly, I get a little emotional about it, she'd say, oh, congratulations, Harry. It's great you're becoming the CEO. Are you still Harry? Are, are you going to somehow get caught up? In, are you going to have a different priority than what's when I said, you know what? No, I, I think I'm, you got me well grounded. Uh, I will never forget what's really important and, and, and what really isn't and what the order of that importance is. Uh, and we spend a lot of time talking about that uh, on a weekly basis. That's really insightful. And thank you for that glimpse into your family and the life. It's sort of interesting as you talk about growing up and building in your career. I think we all have these sliding doors moments when we made a decision and chose a path and it sort of changed the trajectory of our career. Mm -hmm. What was that moment for you and what did you learn from it? Boy, you know, I, I, I think I've got a lot of those moments. Um, and, and part of it, I really do think it's, it's taking the time to be self-reflective and figuring out what really matters and what doesn't matter. And uh, one of those first moments, I think, for me uh, that I sometimes mention in class was uh, I went, mentioned I went to the small liberal arts college, Lawrence University. And when I was a senior, uh, I met a young woman who was a freshman. In fact, it was her first day of school. And I met her. Uh, I started to date her. But I'm a senior. I graduated early. 
literally, I come to Chicago, uh, and I tell my five children, they can't do this now, Kelly, but I, I rationalized this okay 40 years ago. I used to hitchhike uh, from Evanston, Illinois, up to Appleton, Wisconsin, and I did that for, you know, a couple months until her father called me, very intense guy from St. Paul, Minnesota, and said, hey, I know what's going on. My daughter's 18 years old. We need to spend some time together. Uh, and he suggested that I come up to Minnesota, and I thought, uh, okay, fine, um, and I did it, not knowing what was going to go on, and I, I picked the worst time to go. It was the month of December. I fly up there, and um, I thought, we're going to go to a Viking game. He says, no, no, we're not going to a Viking game. Uh, I'm glad you're here for the weekend. We're, we're going on a retreat. And of course, I said, what's a retreat? And uh, he said, you'll find out. Um, and he said, there's something I should tell you. He didn't tell me this until I got up there. And he said, um, it's a silent retreat. I said, what does that mean? He said, you can't shut up for 15 minutes. You will not be talking for the next three days. And then I asked myself the obvious question, how much do I like this guy's daughter? Okay. <laughs> but being a finance guy, some cost, I'm already there. I might as well figure this out. Um, and that weekend was pretty important. It was run by the Jesuits. And they literally sat you down and asked you, what are your values? What's your purpose? What matters? Uh, and this shouldn't be a one-time occasion. You should spend 15 minutes a day doing a personal self-examination. And ever since then, uh, I take 15 minutes at the end of every day going through that list of questions. What are my values? What's my purpose? What matters? What kind of day did I have today? What did I do well? What didn't I do well? Um, how could I be a better leader? How could I be a better follower? Um, and the end of the story is I married his daughter, and for the last now 41 consecutive years, wherever I am in the world, I fly to Minneapolis, Minnesota to go on that three-day silent retreat the first weekend in December. And, and what that did to, for me, Kelly, is it puts everything into perspective, right? It's like we all in our businesses, Kelly, we all do a strategic plan um, and sort of an operating plan. And my thought was, well, why wouldn't you do the same thing for yourself, right? So once a year, I take the time to figure out what, what can I personally do to be a better father, a better spouse, a better Christian, a better leader, a better teacher, and then I do my little 15-minute check-in. And, and what it does is it simplifies things because it's so easy to get wound up about so many things. Thank you for sharing these. Uh, I want to talk about mindset and, and leadership. What kind of mindset did you have back when you first started your career, mm -hmm. I assume you probably were in a cubicle when you first started, right? Yep. And how has it changed as you were climbing up the corporate ladder? Yeah, and, and here's the bizarre part of this one. Um, I don't think it's changed much at all. And the reason I say that, I kind of went into it with the view that I'm gonna do a good job, I'll try to keep this in a good balance, and what I will try to do is keep this all in perspective. And by that I meant, I'm very fortunate, I've got a great Kellogg background, I've got a great Kellogg education, I'm gonna use that, but you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna enjoy every day. So starting off, what I realized was, instead of it's really about me, you know, it's like, wait a minute, if I have the opportunity to influence other people, I'm gonna try to do the best job I can, and I really will enjoy every day. And what's very, very interesting to me, you guys have the background, you know exactly, Kelly, how this works. You can have like 10 managers, we're all first level managers, and maybe there's gonna only be like three directors. And a lot of people spend a whole lot of time thinking about how do I become one of those directors? Well, if they're focusing on how they become one of those directors, okay, are they really developing the people that work for them? And are they really enjoying themselves? And I thought to myself, here's their deal. I'm gonna enjoy this, I'm gonna do the best job I can, I'm gonna develop every single person, even though I'm a first level manager, I got three people, I'm gonna develop them, and I'm gonna create an atmosphere where people wanna work for me. And by the way, if I get chosen to be one of those directors, the only thing I know for sure, I can do a really good job, because I'll get really good people to do, but, but I'm not gonna waste all my time worrying about it and never enjoy my life where I have it. And the crazy part of it is, and you guys will appreciate this. When I bring in guest speakers to my classes now, I find it very interesting. Usually some student, particularly if it's a CEO, they'll say, oh, well, when did you decide to become the CEO? And it was always very interesting. The response they usually get is, geez, you know, I, honestly, I, I really didn't think it was going to be me. And the students, it's a little bit of, okay, here's another one of these humility things. I'm going to kind of gag. And, and they don't realize that if I'm focused it doesn't matter what level. If I'm focused on developing the people, and it's all about building that team, people will do anything for you. But if I wake up one morning and say, you know what? It's all about me. It's about me. 
and I'm going to get to that. Well, then it's no longer about the team. And therefore, the chance of you getting to that role becomes much, much less. Okay? And, and, and again, here's the balance. The balance is, I'm going to enjoy my time. I'm going to do a great job. But wait a minute. If the opportunity comes up, I can do a tremendously good job. Not because of me, but because of the team. Which, by the way, here's the other one I figured out early on. I think it was Kellogg. I think it was self-reflection. What I figured out very early on is it isn't how bright you are. Okay. In fact, I realized, in hindsight, I tell the students this now, Kelly, I had three things going for me, if I'm honest about it. Number one, I took the time to get to know everybody. Okay, I can't walk into the Kellogg cover of the Allen Center without meeting and getting to know every single person. Okay, number one. Number two, by getting to know everybody, you figure out who the really good people are. And number three, and most important, whatever role I'm in, I try to create an environment that everybody wants to work for me. And think about it. If you know everybody and you know who the good people are and the really good people want to work for you, you're going to do remarkably well. I started that off at the very beginning. I kept that up even when I was the CEO. And now I do the same thing when I'm on boards. It's a combination of true self-confidence. I know what I know. I know what I don't know. I'm pretty good, but I'll never be great. I can always get better. It's a journey combined with genuine humility. Every single person matters. And it isn't words, you treat every single person the way you want to be treated. That's the way I, I kind of think of this whole value-based leadership. We love that. And we love the idea of how you're thinking about the growth of your team, not just the growth of yourself. I think that's instrumental in how we develop as leaders. That's what truly makes you a leader is the team below you. But to make a question about you, it can be challenging. It can be really hard. The number one answer you hear from people often is when you ask them, how was your day? You go, they say, I'm busy. People are busy, they're grinding, they're challenged by all of it. How do you get up every day? What's the mindset that you wake up with to stay as driven and clearly as energetic as you are today? Yeah, so this, this in my mind, fantastic question, this in my mind comes down again to, are you self-reflective enough, some would say prayerful, whatever you wanna use, to simplify all of this and put it into perspective. Because Kelly, as you know, what ends up happening, there's a series of things that consume a lot of us. Worry, fear, anxiety, pressure, stress. It, it can actually overcome you, right? But wait a minute, if I'm self-reflective, what do I know? I know I'm gonna do the best job I possibly can. Things aren't always gonna go well. Some things are gonna go poorly. So how am I gonna align myself mentally? And what I decided a long time ago is the following. I will do two things. And Kelly, I'll give it to you, but I say this to myself five times a day. It does not matter what's going to happen, Kelly, when I get up in the morning. I know what I'm going to do. Number one, with a lot of people's help that are much brighter than I am, I will try to do the right thing. Number two, I and we will do the best we can in the time we can allocate to it. And again, I'm giving you a quick summary of this, but if you can convince yourself that no matter what happens... I'll do the right thing, I'll do the best I can do. I'll do the right thing, I'll do the best I can do. I would argue worry, fear, anxiety, pressure, and stress can be significantly reduced. You can never eliminate it. Welcome to the real world, you know. And by the way, we've all had bosses, Kelly, that would say, hey, you know, a little bit of stress and pressure is good. The problem is we got a lot more than a little bit. And the impact of that for me is I try to get worked up about very, very few things, okay? You, you tell me the biggest problem we got, what happened? Why did it happen? What do we do to deal with it? How do we minimize the chance of happening again? And that mindset makes, in my mind, all of this petty stuff significantly decline. And you can keep a lot of balls in the air at the same time. So you eliminate the petty stuff, but there are big challenges that come up. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest challenge facing business leaders today? Boy, I think there's, there's an amazing number of them. I think the biggest challenge many leaders have is that they feel they need to do it themselves. They feel that, oh my goodness, you hear this all the time, you know, it's lonely at the top. Or you'll hear, boy, there's a lot of stress. And quite frankly, even when I was the CEO of Baxter, uh, 55,000 people were in 103 countries, I didn't really feel that much stress. And the only reason I didn't is because, to your point before, I'm going to collect a group of people working for me 
Okay, and by the way, this is not just a CEO thing. If you're a first level manager with 10 people working for you, or you're the CEO with 10 executive vice presidents working for you, I would argue it's the same thing because by the time you get there, you've got the experience and you're ready to do it. Now, picture yourself, you can be with any level. Let's talk about the CEO. If you're the CEO and it's sort of like, oh my goodness, I gotta make these decisions, I gotta make it myself, you're gonna make it pretty stressed out. So well, why would I do that? I got 10 people. So it's like, what do you think? Kelly, what do you think? Je Wait a minute, say that again, Kelly? I think that's it. Because a really good leader doesn't have to be right, they're trying to do the right thing. And so, by having really good people, and you're listening to them, in my mind, that significantly reduces the stress. But I worry that so many people feel like, I need to know everything, I've gotta have all the answers, I, I, I can't make a mistake. Well, guess what? That's not how you're gonna to relate to people. My, my entire definition, you may remember, of leadership is it has nothing to do with titles and organizational charts. Leadership has everything to do with the ability to relate to influence people, and the only way you can influence people is you have to be able to relate to people, okay? And if I can relate to people and they know, Harry knows he knows and doesn't know everything, Harry definitely makes mistakes, Harry's as human as the rest of us, we can get everything done, we can get everything done. And I think that's the biggest problem right now is that people think they need to do it all and they don't spend enough time on the only thing that really matters, which is to develop the people and develop the team and to be able to, to effectively communicate. So let's flip the table a little bit. You're sitting on the other side, you're one of those people that were working for you. Mm -hmm. What is it that you wish they would have asked you? What is it that you wish they would have understood or that they could have helped you with more on your journey? Um, again, Kelly, always uh, probe and push a little bit. I, I don't think that was ever much of a concern because what I would do in every position I was in, I'd sit down, let's call it 10, is it, is it five, is it 15? But let's say I've got 10 people in different, depending on the job I was in. I made it real clear to them that, you know what? I clearly don't know everything. There's a lot more things I don't know. And by the way, Kelly, if you work for me, I don't want you just to give me your opinion. I want you to challenge me because I will convince you immediately I have absolutely no need to be right. I'm trying to do the right thing. So are there certain things, Kelly, I'm doing I should do more of? Are there certain things I should start doing? Are there certain things I should stop doing? Uh, back up the chair because I want to know what you think. And by the way, Kelly, the relationship I want to have with you is literally the only reason I know something that you don't is that you don't ask. And I didn't think of telling you because I thought you already knew. Okay, so we've got this incredibly open relationship that we can be incredibly open with one another. Um, so I always felt that the people who challenged me, I really made sure that they got rewarded for it, right? Because I mean, Kelly, you know, common sense. If I say, hey, I want you guys to challenge me, and you say to yourself, oh, that's interesting. The last three people who challenged Harry are all unemployed. Let's not wonder why no one's challenging me, right? But if I create an environment that the person who challenged me, hey, Kelly, you know what? Uh, I'd like you to lead that team. People are gonna say, wait a minute, I thought he was gonna get fired. You know what, I, I actually think she got promoted, okay? So, so I, I like to use that um, Andrew Carnegie quote. Uh, it went along something like, the older I get, the less I listen to what people say, the more I watch what they do, right? So if you actually set that expectation and live it, it has an enormous impact. So it's really interesting. You talk about being introspective. You talk about growing leaders. You talk about getting rid of some of the petty stuff. If you had to narrow it down and somebody asked you in an elevator, what's the one characteristic you believe every leader should possess, what would that be? I'm self-reflecting here. Um, I guess people development. I, and if I was going to add one that goes closely aligned with it, people development and effective communication. And it's funny, I was in New York a couple days ago and I, somebody asked me, where do you spend your time as a leader? And I said, well, I said, it's all between people development and effective communication. And they'll say, well, what percentage of your time would you spend on that? And I think I just literally get people, uh, can't believe when I say, the number's about 90%. And they'll say, wait, wait a second, wait a second, Harry, you said we could challenge. If you're spending 90% of your time on people and communication, when do you get all the work done? And I always have to kind of smile. If, the famous if, if I've got all the right people, I don't have five out of 10, six out of 10, I got 10 out of 10. If I've got 10 out of 10, because I've, gone, I've been fanatical about developing those people, and every single person knows exactly what we need to do and are willing to challenge me, if they don't think, what else is there to do? But the reason this is a shock even to CEOs, senior people, is let's be honest, the average person with 10 people, at least two of those people are the absolute wrong person. 
They're the absolute wrong person. They can't deal with it. They can't give effective t- a, a feedback or whatever. And so what ends up happening? If you're that person and you're not going to let me down and two of the people aren't getting the job done and you can't deal with it, what do you do? You do the work of those two people. So the eight great people aren't getting any feedback or development at all, okay? Um, and we're not being very effective. So, so the, the entire focus on people and people development and communication drives 90% of everything. <clears throat> so stronger teams lead to stronger business growth. That's, Bingo. That's Very the simple. End of it. All right, let's change gears for a second. There is a bit of a culture shift happening in business right now, and mm-hmm. there are some serious questions that are being posed to business leaders. One of them is around the political environment. It's pretty divisive today. Mm-hmm. How do you deal with the added pressure on business leaders to have a political point of view or voice in politics? Yeah, well, this is one of my favorite topics uh, that all comes under one of my four principles that I try to get people, I've been talking about it actually all this morning, of how do you develop a balanced perspective, okay? Because as you said, you can talk about any political issue, you can talk about anything you want, and people have very, very strong opinions. The problem I find, my opinion, remember I always say, I don't have any answers, many opinions. One of my strongest opinions is that that. Often people with strong opinions have virtually no understanding of perspectives other than their own. They understand their own. And I am fanatical about how do you make sure you are giving people the ability to develop a balanced perspective? What does that mean? Is that you take the time to understand multiple perspectives. And I love to use the St. Francis line. I seek to understand before I'm understood. I say that 10 times a day. If I'm talking with you, Kelly, I try not to say, well, I don't understand. Because I think it's actually ignorant. If I take the time, I can understand, then I'll decide, do I agree or disagree? So the first thing I'm encouraging Kellogg students to do, um, senior leaders when I'm giving different talks, is literally take the time to develop a balanced perspective. Let's be very practical. I don't care where people are. You can be on the far right and be on the far You can be wherever you want to be. But if you're watching CNN, you better watch Fox. If you're reading the New York Times, getting a little bit, you better read the Wall Street Journal. I highly recommend you read the Financial Times and the Economist and maybe the International Herald Tribune. So then you hear all sides of this thing. You don't say, I don't understand. Okay. You may say, I disagree, but you take the time to understand and then you're able to accomplish much more. I, I was very, very impacted by my grandfather. I talk about a lot of him in my writing. One of his great lines when I was just a kid, he was a history teacher. He used to tease me and say, Harry... Life is much simpler, much simpler, if you only understand your side of the story. There's multiple sides of the story, okay? So, so that ability to do it, and you'll, it's, you'll appreciate, Kelly, often there's, oh, well, we can't talk about that. That's a sensitive topic. I think leaders ought to be able to talk about anything, but literally make sure it's clear, this is an opinion, I respect your opinion, and... Let's try to figure out, based on what you think and what I think, is there some middle ground that, that, we, could, that we, could, we could operate with? And so I approach, I approach every topic like that. Um, I don't know. Does that give you a sense of that? Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And um, I think Vulcan brought me in specifically to ask all the hard questions. You can ask me anything. <laughs> you can ask me anything. Um, and one of them is, as you know, we're recording this in the middle of Women's History Month. Yeah. Tomorrow is International Women's Day. So I would be personally remiss as a woman not to ask your perspective on the shift of female leadership over the last decade. And how do you believe we continue to ensure women are being given equal opportunities in the mm-hmm. workplace? Sure. Well, as I said, Kelly, first of all, I can, I'm trying to think of a topic we couldn't talk about, okay? Uh, this is actually another one of my favorite topics, okay? And I didn't know where we were going to head on all these things. But, but this one, in my mind, I, I love because I'm, when I say I give it opinions, here's uh, a little model, okay? And you tell me how, fa- how far you want to go on this one. Uh, often in my classes, you may remember, I talk about there's four principles that drive everything, right? Self-reflection, balance, true self-confidence and genuine humility. And so very often, uh, I, was doing, I was talking to a group of 300 women some time ago, and I was the only guy in the room, and they said, well, we'd like to understand, how do you, how do you uh, stack up men versus women when we think about these positions? I said, well, I give my opinion, okay, in general, because it's a generalization and it's opinion, there's always exceptions, but, you know, I kind of view it as I find women in general to be much more self-reflective by nature. I think they have a habit of being more balanced, and I think for sure they demonstrate genuine humility more than men. 
okay? Which only, only leaves one left, which is um, true self-confidence. And I said, I wish I had taken more psychology, uh, and I'm talking to these three women, but I said, my sense is that you folks have a tendency to want to be so honest and so open that you kind of sell yourself short. And I don't know if this is helpful, but one of them said, oh, can you give me an example? And I thought, okay, I got three and one, what's it, where's this gonna go? And I thought, I'll give it a, I'll give it a run. So I said, Here, here's the deal. I'm interviewing for a job, and I'm interviewing Vulcan and you. And there's 10 characteristics to, to perform on this job. So I interview you, Kelly, and it turns out, eight of the 10, you're absolutely phenomenal. You're phenomenal. And, but part of the discussion, I talk to the other two, and you're letting, you know, Harry, uh, you know, I, I don't have much experience in these two, and, you know, that, that's, uh, that'll be a harder lift, and, you know, I'll, I'll work on whatever, okay? And I interview you. Well, now I talk to Vulcan. Now, on a good day, he's maybe good at one of the ten. Just no more than one. I don't mean to hassle you, but one, maybe one. But when he comes in, it's sort of like, you know what? Hey, whatever I don't know, I know somebody does know. Give me the ball. We'll get it done. Whatever. So then, myself, through the other interview. Now we end up in the room. Closed door. Most unlikely, probably four guys, men, and we say, all right, what do we think? Boy, this Kelly, she's absolutely phenomenal. But I don't know. Uh, she, she doesn't seem real convinced of this. Hey, if we put her in the role, then what's this going to look like? And by the way, Vulcan's ready to go. He's ready to go. And whatever he doesn't know, he'll figure it out. And unfortunately, Vulcan gets the job. Now, that is the way it was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. I think we're making progress. Unfortunately, in my mind, it's at like glacial speed, okay? But where we are now is I think women are starting to realize, wait a minute, by honestly saying I need to work on a couple of these things, I can do it and I'll get it done. But the flip side of it is every boss needs to say, guess what? She's much better than this character and I'm going to help her, I'm gonna help her get there. I'm going to help her get there. So a combination of how, how maybe women could, but I think right now, the light is on where there's no excuse anymore. See, we, we could rationalize when I was at Kellogg 40 years ago, I don't think more than 10, 15% of my Kellogg class was women. So you'd say, well, they're not in a lot, well, of course there's not that. Now, now, I believe this year, 50% of the class is women. There's no excuse, there's no excuse. So, I, and I got three daughters, one of them who just graduated from Kellogg. I mean, the opportunity for women now I think is gonna be enormous because the light has gone on. It isn't just the right thing to do. It is without question the business judgment that you pick up by having a much more diverse group of people at, at the table. And I say diverse on but not just race, not just gender. I'm talking about educational background, geographic background, and, and everything else. That's right, women. You heard it here. We can get it done. So we're going to build the confidence to go out and do it. I fully support that. And I just have to say, Vulcan's a 10 out of 10, just in case. <laughs> We'd hire him in a heartbeat. It's a 10 out of 10. So we're talking a lot about the things that are sort of shaking up in the business world. If you could. If you could change one thing about the world of business, what would it be and why? Hmm. Well, I can think of a number of them, but if it was just one, it probably would be the one that we just talked about, which is how do you make sure that people in business really do understand multiple perspectives so we can find a middle ground on things as opposed to just the insane polarization where you know people only hear their their perspective and and, and we get nothing done and I don't I don't even know uh, Kelly whether we understand how far this has shifted and how quickly right what what gets me very I'm an optimistic guy you can tell that but what gets me concerned Kelly is I would say as recently as six seven years ago you have a view and I have a view it could be gun control, it could be immigration, it could be whatever. We have a different view. I understand why you have that view. I disagree. Now where are we? Now, because of this incredible polarization, this whole topic you hear all the time about echo chambers, okay, if 100% of my information is consistent with what I only want to hear, and 100% of yours is what you want to hear, now, I don't understand how you could possibly believe that. So I move from being, I like you, but we have a different opinion to, I dislike you, I hate you, and now there's a certain amount of, I've gotta stop you. The impact of that on the world, in my mind, is incredibly detrimental. I mean, we are, we are headed in a very, very bad place unless we get this turned around. And this isn't just a US issue, okay? I know what goes on in Turkey, I know what goes on in Europe, look at what's happening in Latin America now. When, when we no longer take the time to understand the other perspective, welcome to the chaos that we're in. And it, I think it is without question. It's the biggest problem we have now uh, in government, in business, 
in, in family life? I mean, I don't know if you guys heard this, but somebody told me that uh, if a young woman uh, came to the parents and said, hey, I'm, I'm, this is my, my, my boyfriend, we're thinking about getting married, up to, up to maybe 10 years ago, the question would be, well, do you share a similar religion or whatever? Now, the number one question is, what, what political party are they affiliated with? That's kind of a pretty sad place to be. And it impacts business, it impacts every, daily life. So lack of knowledge is no longer an excuse. Lack of knowledge, it's all there. It's all there. For, for you know, God knows we have so much information. It's, are you, are you responsible and diligent enough to take the time to understand the multiple perspectives? Rather than saying, well, take any example you want. What do you think? You know, take an example. Well, I, I don't understand what Putin's doing in the Ukraine. Oh, I understand. That doesn't mean I agree, but, but, but at least I understand. Okay, well, why does some people believe gun control? Oh, I understand. And if you can truly understand, the chance of finding some middle ground is much, much higher. Great. 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 I want to shift the topic uh, and talk about Kellogg and Kellogg impact. Um, what is the Kellogg impact on your professional and personal life? I know you have been actually between the lines, you've been talking about it, but how would you define it like one more time, like for us in a more specific and targeted way, the impact of your Kellogg on your professional and per personal life. And I have to also admit one thing, I think you impacted Kellogg too. Like I think the impact is mutual. Uh, maybe we can also talk about the two impact of Kellogg on your life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm smiling because it's very hard for me to separate Kellogg from the rest of my life, okay? <laughs> and uh, the, the, the little background, maybe I'll tell you, but, you know, speed me along here. The impact it had, I think I mentioned to you, I was a, I was a math major in college. Uh, and when I came to Kellogg, it was a question, well, how am I going to pay for this? And uh, what I ended up doing was I ended up getting a, a role where I graded all the finance papers for the faculty. Um, I paid most of my tuition by, by doing Doing that, and when I was graduating, uh, uh, a fellow named Don Jacobs uh, was becoming the um, the dean. He was the head of the finance department, and I, was I said, "Hey, congratulations! You'll you'll be great. I'm out of here." He said, "Well, you're going nowhere. First of all." Uh, I kind of own you a little bit because I paid you for it. Second, uh, guess what? Baxter's in Chicago, so wh where are you going, okay? And for literally for the 25 years, every two or three weeks, he would call me and say, I need you on a panel, I need you to be a guest speaker. And I made the mistake of saying, if it wasn't for Kellogg, uh, I would never become the CEO of a $15 billion company. He said, I will never let you forget that. I will never forget that. And so I was always here. I mean, I lived pretty close. And the day it was announced that I was stepping down as the CEO of Baxter, uh, when it came over the, over the wire, I think it was literally the next day, he called me and said, oh, this is fantastic news. I said, well, that's not fantastic. I'm leaving Baxter. I'm going to probably run another company. He says, you did that for 25 years. I need you to teach. Get down here. And he hung up. Um, so being a very differential guy, I came down to Kellogg. And he goes, I, I really want you to teach. And I said, you don't mean like have a syllabus, great, that's not, I run companies. He said, I think you said you do whatever I told you to do. And he thought I was gonna do finance because of my finance back. I took every finance class. I was a cash flow officer at Baxter. And I said, you got all these brilliant PhDs. I said, I got an MBA. He goes, what do you wanna do? I said, well, it's obvious I'm gonna be doing something. So I said, um, I would love to focus on leadership value and ethics. How do you effectively run a global company? How do you develop people? How do you serve on boards? And he said, that's fine. You start in two weeks, you better get a syllabus together. And uh, it took me just a couple weeks to realize, I don't like teaching, I love teaching. And if any of you guys have done any teaching, you realize, in my case, until I can explain something really clearly to a group of very bright people, I may think I understand it, but not really, okay? And to this day now, I literally believe that the people who come to Kellogg are going to be the next generation of people that have the opportunity to lead the world, whether it is for profit, some of the things Kelly's now doing a nonprofit, it could be do things in the government, and so, so for in my case to have a small impact on the next generation of people that can lead the world, how could it get better than this, right? And uh, you know when the dean says to me, well, hey, you know, Harry, your age now, what are your plans? I said, well, you know, yes, I'm in my 60s, but you know what? I'm gonna give you plenty of warning. I'm probably down to my last 20 years. Because when I'm <laughs> my age, I, I may have to slow down, but why would I, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I love doing this, and uh, you know, I, I always tell everybody, if it hadn't been for Kellogg, there's no scenario I would have had the opportunities I've had. And so now, the opportunities to help as many people as I can, and when you and Kelly call and say, hey, would you, of course I'm gonna do this. I'll, I'll do anything for people at Kellogg that wanna, that wanna make a difference. 
you have witnessed in the past like 40 years the global expansion of this institution mm -hmm. uh, and you have been part of it yeah you have been one of the drivers like for change mm -hmm. and you just admitted like you are ready for the next 20 years right so with that i want to talk about like um the future the future of the mba education business education mm -hmm. and kellogg's role in it i think or expansion global expansion one of the unique and first ones in this particular space um with that, how do you see the future of business education and what could and should be Kellogg's role in it? Well, first of all, and again, I always give credit uh, to Dean Jacobs because, you know, setting up this Allen Center building and saying, you know what, we're going to educate people that have graduated from institutions and we're going to let our professors be live in the real world, deal with real issues and have that relationship where they learn, the professors learn. And by the way, a lot of these folks that are coming in here, senior level people realizing, my goodness, these professors are really great. I'm going to encourage all my younger people to come to Kellogg. All right. And the idea of, wait a minute. We operate in a globe, so let's think globally. I, I literally just got back uh, from spending 10 days in Hong Kong, okay, um, and I'm heading down to Miami in two weeks. So we've got Asia covered, we've got Europe covered. We've like this whole idea of how can we have an impact on the on the entire world, and when we talk about um, the education of, of how it's developing, I, I sort of look at it as, you know, when I was back, when I was here back in the dark ages, okay, you know, there was a lot of, you know, hey, finance, accounting, operations, sort of, I don't like the term, but we always use the, sort of these hard skills. Can't walk away, that's important. But this term of soft skills, I find remarkable, kind of a crazy word, because at the end of the day, as you guys know, once you moved into management positions, it's all about people development effective communication, negotiation, prioritization, okay? And so your ability to have a global perspective and where I think now as we move into the future, anybody who's gonna be running a business, okay, and you guys have been in them, you better have not just a perspective on your company and your industry, I think you have to have a perspective on what I call the entire holistic global environment, okay? You, you should have an opinion and a view as to what are the implications of what happens in the Ukraine in the next three or four years? Some of the things that are going on in Turkey right now, what are the implications of that overall? Who gets into NATO or the EU or doesn't? What really happens with how China treats Hong Kong? Or what happens with Taiwan? Okay, or what, what will Japan be? Your ability to understand and have an opinion and a perspective on the world, if you're gonna be a global leader, is something that I think we're making progress, but I think that's that's the adventure we're on now to take that to the next dimension and making sure that folks like you that have graduated, okay, you know, this whole leadership thing, it's not a destiny, it's a journey, okay? That's why the importance of podcasts like you're doing are so key. How do we keep making sure, at least in my case, every day I'm on this earth, I can get better. It's a journey. Leadership is not a destination. So how do we make sure that people have graduated five or 10 years ago what really is the implication of AI? What, what does this cryptocurrency, what is Bitcoin? What it really is, it? what does it mean? How does it transform the financial markets, okay? Uh, you know, I'm in board meetings now where we're talking about uh, cyber, uh, you know, uh, defense and everything else. Well, think about it. The average person on a board of a Fortune 200 company is 63 years old. Okay, you talk about, we have to worry about uh, cyber attacks. It's sort of like, wh what is it? I, I, I know it's important, but what do you want me to do about it and what is it? So this ability to continuously educate so that we're all becoming more global, more foresightful, and constantly bringing Kellogg people back, whether it's for programs, whether it's podcasts, so that, that every day we can get better than the day before. You had a lot of emphasis on the global scale of things uh, in your in your answer. So with that, I'm an immigrant professional, mm -hmm. uh, and I was privileged to experience Kellogg Executive MBA education and take all of the uh, some international electives, and it was truly a blessing to meet with different Kellogg leaders from different geographies here in the Allen Center and also in their host locations, um, and also the classroom. 
um, our classroom was in a very vertly environment. Like we had a lot of immigrant professional students like myself in the classroom. And, um, and this all changed with the global expansion and also um, Kellogg's openness to, to diversity. So um, I can clearly see the value of Kellogg for myself from an immigrant professional uh, student perspective. And one thing that I can say is really confidence. And then the, the level of confidence Kellogg is giving and projecting to its immigrant uh, student body is really, really life changing. Uh, but I'm curious about like your view on um, the impact of us, the immigrant students, immigrant professionals at EMBA program, immigrant students in the full time program, you're teaching them every, all the time. So what is your view on, maybe it's not the right term to say us, but then immigrant professional students, like what is your um, view of, of us, like in the institutional evolution of, of Kellogg? I, I think it's absolutely critical because if you're really trying to create a global community, if you're trying to get a, a group of people that can truly impact the world, you want as much diversity as you possibly can. And you know, my mind is to some of the fact some of these immigrants come here and they stay here, super. They come here and they go back to their home countries and they change the world from that standpoint. And we're all communicating enough to make the world a better place. I think that's what we want to do if, if we want to create a, a global world environment where we'd like to be part of. OK, um, you know, when I say we can talk about anything, I, I, I don't know if we want to get into political discussions, but I, I have to say, uh, I think we need as, 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 as America uh, to realize the strength of this country for 270 years, the longest standing continuous democracy in the face of the earth has all been caused because of immigration. OK, so the fact that now we have some, you know, thoughts that maybe that's not a good idea. Hello. What, what, what planet are you on? OK. And so encouraging people to educate people of the importance of that, I, I think, is, is, is really key. Um, it, where, does that, where does the growth come from? Where's the growth going to come in the future? How do we cooperate? And, and by, by not, for, not really helping that and creating a scenario where I, whether it's the United States, Europe, Latin America, where suddenly we get some of these more nationalistic tendencies, I, I think that's a, a, a bad step in the wrong direction. A bad step in the wrong direction. And I think we need to be very vocal about that, uh, explaining why thinking globally, we can act local, but thinking global uh, really makes the world a better place, given the fact that we've got to deal with climate control and everything else that we're, we're, we're dealing with in the world. So. As we're coming to the end of our time, I just want to pause and say thank you again. We incredibly appreciate your perspective. It is helping us think about how we evolve as leaders, how we evolve as humans, and we are very appreciative and, and feel very honored to spend the time with you. As we close out, what question should we have asked you, but we didn't? And we'll leave that as our your parting words with us. Mm. Well, I like to talk for hours, so we'll have to do this again sometime. But I... Um what what I tell you, we we covered we covered a, an, an awful lot of topics. Um, I, I guess just further reinforcing things that we've talked about. I just really do believe we need to create an environment where more people have a better understanding of all these different perspectives. And I, I think anything we can do to do that, and I think I, I give you guys a lot of credit for this podcast, anything we can do to give people a view of, all right, you've got your view, but now I really want you to understand why this is very different than, than what you think. Um, because I think, I think that becomes the answer to almost everything. Uh, we shut down things when we don't take the time to listen thoroughly. Um, and we talk about effective communication very often somebody will say to me, a younger student will say, oh yeah, I need to be better effective communication. Uh, you know, I'm gonna take a, a course on that. And I would say, wait a minute, before you get too far, 90% of communication is listening, okay? I, I wanna listen enough so that I actually, you feel like you're actually being heard. And then I will play back of, okay, so Kelly, is, is this what you're saying? Is that what you're actually believing? I wanna prove to you that I'm, I'm really listening to you. And unfortunately right now, because of, of uh, social media, because of the echo chambers, that just isn't happening anymore. And I, I want to encourage every Kellogg, if I could encourage Kellogg folks, I'd really love to encourage every Kellogg person in the Kellogg community 
to minimize the number of times they say, I don't understand, and maximize the amount of time to say, hey, you know what, I appreciate your perspective, I understand your perspective, you know what, here's my view, and it may be somewhat different than you. Finding, finding the common links as opposed to spending all of our time talking about what the disagreements are. Harry, I appreciate your perspective, and thank you very, very much for your time today. We look forward to the podcast coming out, and Volk, and you can go ahead and close everything out. So thank you very much. I, this was really a very impactful um, episode so far, and really appreciate both of your time. Uh, this is really, for me, a peak moment uh, in my journey in podcasting. So can't thank you enough for your time. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, and I, and I wish, uh, wish both of you, and I wish all the listeners the, the, the very best. You know what? If you want me to make one more thing to you, because I can always go on. Absolutely. Here, here's, the, here's the one challenge I have for the Kellogg folks, for yep. your class and everybody else. Um, let's think about all the issues in the world. Mm -hmm. Let's think about all the problems in the world. Mm -hmm. And you may remember from class, we define, well, who's going to deal with all these issues? There's this famous group of people called those guys. <laughs> All right, we are those. If, we're, if, if Kellogg yeah. folks, if you talk about this globalization, you talk about the impact of immigrants, if, if we can all realize we are those guys, we are the men or women who's going to do something about it, let's, let's, not, let's stop talking about what the challenge issue is and let's talk about how we're going to influence it and, and to make a difference. Because Kellogg folks, we, we are those guys. Thank you for diving deep with us on another episode of Lehigh Love Ego High Impact Mindset. Join us every week as we discover the stories, strategies, and insights that will empower you to grow personally and professionally. Stay inspired and catch you in the next one.